The discussion that follows was the one which, of the four, I was most apprehensive about. We have a party in government, the SNP, and a candidate not in government, Tony Giuliano. What's the right approach in that situation? What's the fair approach? The truth is, this election is overshadowed by the European question. Or as the press incessantly phrases it, the question of Britain's place in Europe. And by the way, I fear this is fast becoming the age of the understatement. But regardless, here we are, and this is a question I often ask myself. Without UKIP, are we here at all? I mean, in a historical sense, in a rational universe, by which I mean dropping the idea of fate, quote-unquote, altogether, there are only really two ways of answering that question. How did we get here? We're either here because of individuals, or we're here because of what are called trends and forces. Similarly, can you imagine the last 10 years of Scottish politics without the SNP? The impact of this party, love it or leave it, cannot be understated. It's a party which, in addition to its extremely proactive and motivated support, can also claim to be the near sole architect not simply of an election victory or two, but of a cultural and political shift to which the word seismic is itself an understatement. Like UKIP, it polarizes opinion. And like UKIP, I have my differences with many of those who support the SNP. And many of these differences are serious. But if we are to avoid a calcification of entrenched divisions, which I spoke about at the beginning of my first discussion, which would be catastrophic, by the way, we need to find common ground. We must also remember critically that those with whom we may disagree are often guided by the purest of motivations. And my guest today is no exception. Tony Giuliano is the Scottish National Party candidate for Edinburgh Western. I immensely enjoyed our discussion, and that discussion is what follows. I hope you enjoy it. This session is composed of two parts. As per last week's discussion with Kat Headley of Scottish Labour, which in addition to my chat with Alex Cole Hamilton of the Liberal Democrats, you can find on my channel, the time codes for each topic or question I discussed with Tony are in the description below this video, allowing you to jump around a little. And as always, and lastly, if you like this video, drop it a thumbs up. And if you really like it, consider finding your way to that red subscribe button also below this video. I'd really appreciate it. Tony Giuliano, you're running for elected office. Um, please summarize your platform and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you for coming to my campaign hub in the heart of Christorfen here Good in uh, St. John's Road. Um, well, I'm standing for a number of reasons. First of all, because I'm passionate about health and inequalities and I want to be able to to be a voice in our parliament to uh, to tackle some of the inequalities that exist in our country particularly the health inequalities I work for a mental health charity uh, in the third sector um, and I, I, I'm keen to bring my experience to, to the Scottish Parliament uh, the experience that I've uh, gained over the uh, this this time that I've worked um, at, uh, at this particular charity uh, to talk about the, the services that we need locally, uh, the NHS services uh, that need to be transformed, um, not just for mental health, but for health in general. Um, and I want to be uh, a voice also for the thousands of carers, the unpaid carers who are doing a tremendous amount of work um, uh, throughout the country that don't have a huge amount of recognition. And I think they need more recognition. I was a carer myself, cared for my mother for many years, and I know the huge amount of work that, that they do. Uh, and and you know supporting uh, our NHS and supporting uh, our services across ac across the country, um, and I suppose um, at a time when we're going to be getting more powers in the Scottish Parliament, I want to be involved in shaping those new services uh, and those um, uh, new opportunities that we will have uh, in Scotland. I want to be able to to use my experience uh, to do that. That's nationally, um, locally. Uh, I've worked for this constituency uh, as a caseworker in the Scottish Parliament for four years, uh, and I want to bring, uh, you know, uh, my experience of working in local issues uh, in this area uh, to Parliament, but also to stand up for the communities of this constituency. And and of course, um, uh, carers, especially unpaid carers, as you mentioned. Aside from people who are unwell, I mean, an aging population that's going to become presumably more of an issue. In the future, so I think that's a very important issue um, to be running on, right? I well, mean, absolutely. Especially in the context of today. Absolutely, and you know, we've said that we will raise carers' allowance when we get the power to do so um, to uh, the same level as job seekers' allowance, meaning that carers will be six hundred uh, pounds a year 
better off mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that's um, an important step anyway, forward um, but we need to do we need to do a lot more to, to make sure that they are supported that they yeah, have yeah. rights and obviously the carers bill that went through Parliament yeah. was a step was a step forward in that in that direction yeah, that but can you imagine if uh, if, if, if we were relying on the NHS to deliver all the services that carers deliver yeah. every day uh, for so many people uh, so the respite um, it, sir, it, 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 oh, you know, the, we need to increase the, number, the amount of respite that, that is given to, uh, to to carers to ensure that they've got, um, uh, you know, that that they are able to, if if they're doing this on a long term basis, that they are able to continue caring. That their mental health is not affected by it, because they do need support to be able to to perform their tasks. Uh, and to care for their loved ones. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it was, is that something that you'd like personally to see more completely rolled into the NHS? Or do you think that one of the problems with the NHS is that it's attempting to do too much? Or do you think that the government should create separate programmes to help people like carers and treat it separately from health and the national? Well, we're seeing the integration of health and social care, yeah. which means that you know, our investment in that, working with local councils to make sure that we're bringing care into the community, I think yes. that's important. I want to see more um, health services integrated in the community, and that's what this integration of health and social care is aimed to do. Um, so, uh, a revolution in primary care as well, supporting our GP, supporting our doctors. Um, I think that's very important. Um, but also, investing in specialist services. So, what we're going to be doing if we are re-elected on the 5th of May is um, investing in two new elective treatment centres. Mm -hmm. So, one in Livingston, St John's Hospital, uh, and uh, which serves part of this constituency, uh, and also the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. And that will be dealing with op operations like cataract and uh, knee, hip, hip replacements and knee procedures. That's important because it takes pressure off a &E, it takes pressure off other waiting times in other departments. And it creates specialist centres, mm. uh, meaning that you know older people, because we're all living longer, mm. have those centres to go to and don't have to trek over to the other side of the country because currently we have to go to the Golden Jubilee at the other side of the country. So we will, in Lothian we will have these two new centres um, which will benefit many, many people and take pressure off uh, elsewhere. So I want to see more localised services, I want to see more specialised services. With regard to mental health, um, I want to see uh, more than the SNP is committing 150 million, mm -hmm. um, but I also um, want to see more social prescribing services locally. By that, I mean things like uh, exercise classes, painting mm -hmm. classes, talking therapies, not just the medication that is very often easily prescribed, mm -hmm. but the other local services that can be really useful to people uh, and can really help them to recovery. I mean, um, I think that gave people a very good idea of, of kind of where your motivations are, wh which direction you're coming into politics from, um, and I think people find that very interesting. I have an, another question, kind of moving away from the economic side. I, um, as in, I mentioned before the show, I'm, I'm a Eurosceptic, though to an extent my heart is not in the complete dissolution of the European Union, which will, have, will, which will happen, I think, if Britain leaves, because it's such a huge building block in the Union. It'd be like if Britain left uh, the United Nations. It just doesn't mm. make any sense. Cause we I'm going to disagree with you on Nations. that. I'm going to disagree um, with you on that. Do you think Britain should sit on the Security Council of the United Nations? Uh, no, no, on the, no, no, on, right. the, on the point that, uh, um, no, I, I, I agree that, that, um, mm. that the United Kingdom is a huge component yes. of the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, if the UK left, I think that the EU would continue to function. Um, because the EU existed without the UK, it, it was formed without the UK. Yes. The UK um, decided it didn't want to be part of the European project at the start, and then when it realised it was in its interests, of course, it knocked on the door of the other member mm -hmm. states. So and the argument would be that, that both Britain and Europe have fused together over decades organically. Oh, sure, 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 sure. And severing the ties is sure. not the same as, say, disconnecting a cable from the wall. It'd be like chopping a tree down. Sure. And, it, look, it know. makes no sense. Yeah. The whole thing makes no sense. If it did happen, it, the EU would continue to function on its own uh, without the UK. There's no, I have absolutely no For doubt about that. How long would it continue to function in its current state? I well, you know, there's as people. I say, I'm a Eurosceptic. I don't want it. I don't want us necessarily to leave. I'm hovering. There's but people. Convince me. Well, okay. Yeah. There's people. There's people that would argue that mm -hmm. actually, if the UK wasn't part of the EU, we'd actually be able to get on with 
<laughs> some further integration, probably a little bit faster. But look, I want the UK as a whole mm-hmm. to be part of the European Union. I want Scotland to remain part of the EU. Um, so let me sell it to you. Yes, in, sell in, it to in, you. in a nutshell. Yes. We're a European nation. We're Europeans. We and we are, as part of a one continent, working together um, with our neighbours. Mm-hmm. And if we didn't have a European Union, we'd have to make one up. Because how else would we be fighting crime, cross-border crime together? How else would we be doing trade together without a common market that makes our prices cheaper, that helps our farmers, that that protects our workers' rights? It's the European Union that, that came up with the... Uh, maternity leave and holiday entitlements. If it wasn't for the EU during those Tory Thatcher years, uh, uh, and well, we'd have no social policies. There would be no development of social policies, and mm-hmm. it's only thanks to the development of EU social policies that we that we're able to enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Freedom of movement, a huge right as European citizens, that we're able to work, to live, to study, to retire in any European country. And that's the whole point of living in a continent together. Mm-hmm. The fact that you can, as a European citizen, Enjoy your freedoms as a European, and that's that, that's that's the whole story of Europe. And I would encourage people not to look at the sums and the figures about how much we put in and how much we take out. That was a whole, that was a whole uh, Scottish independence yes. um, um, approach mm-hmm. to looking at the referendum. It's wrong. It's about the big picture. Do we or do we not want to share our future with our partners and work together as Europeans? And do we want to be part of a bigger club and a bigger family uh, that is the European Union of independent member states, which is not the same as the United Kingdom. Mm. A lot of people like to make that comparison. Well, it's not the same thing. The EU is a a family of independent Mm. nations. Well, you've said further integration, though. So the assumption would be that the European Union, to play devil's advocate to an extent, though I say, as I said before, I sympathise with many of the positions of uh, Eurosceptics, uh, particularly those in Greece, um, with the governing party in Greece uh, and their complaints last year, which um, people like Yanis Varoufakis, who make very powerful yeah. arguments against the European Union, but like me, is sort of wavering. He's mostly in. He wants, to, well, he wants Britain to stay in. He is. Personally. He's Well, the thing about him, he's pro-Europe. You look at Syriza mm-hmm. in Greece, yeah. they're a very pro-European party. Mm-hmm. What they're against is neoliberalism. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to distinguish in Scotland between being anti-European and being neoliberal. Mm-hmm. Because I believe in a social Europe. Yes. Right? I want a European Union that has social rights at its core and not a neoliberal Thatcher right uh, or David Cameron style Europe à la carte. Mm. What David Cameron wants is no social chapter, limited environmental laws, Hardly any interference whatsoever, Mm. because he wants a neoliberal business club. Mm. That's no use to anybody here in Scotland. We want to have a social European Union that can look after workers' rights, that can look after our interests uh, as people, and not just as big firms and businesses. Well, I agree with you in the sense that the biggest problem with neoliberalism is corporatism. Yes. Um, But I would describe myself as neoliberal in a great many respects. Um, Though, I mean, at the same time, a very left-wing party in Greece. A lot of concerns across the union. I mean, when you mentioned earlier further integration, um, the do you think this debate's become too polarized? Has it become too much? I mean, because you do see people on the left who are voting to leave, and people on the right who are oh, voting yeah. to stay in. Um, if we want to continue to break it down to a left-right kind of divide, if we wanted to go libertarian authoritarian, if you ask a lot of people in Greece, they're being roughed up by the European Union. Um, and you mentioned farmers earlier. I mean, I've spoken to people from Portugal who say that they get a very raw deal when they trade with the Germans, for example. The Germans mm-hmm. give them heavy agricultural equipment, combine harvesters, whatever, and they sell them back the food they use to grow. They use the combine harvesters to grow, and, and they can get a raw end of the deal. A similar kind of thing to what you hear about farmers in the third world that kind of get ripped off by these big agribusinesses. In many parts of Europe, you have concerns like that, including what people see as a lack of accountability. Um, and so how do you answer yes. those? And I think a lot of those people who, may, who have those criticisms, like me, are not entirely in favour of leaving, but we just see those flaws in the Absolutely. system. Absolutely. Look, yeah. the flaws in the system are yeah. there, and there's mm-hmm. plenty of them. But that actually is, a, to me, that's an argument for more cooperation. Yes. And, it, uh, and it's an argument for the European Parliament to have a greater say uh, and, uh, and, and a 
because we know at the moment it's the European Commission and the heads of government. Yes. Heads of government get together. I mean, look at what happened in Greece. It's a, it, What role did the European Parliament have in it? None. Mm. It was the heads of government that came together. Um, and when people say Brussels did this, Brussels did that, it was the capitals of uh, the, 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 the governments of individual member states that came together and decided that they did not want to help Greece mm. uh, as much as they could have. You know, so let's remember who it is that's making these decisions. It's the right-wing governments mm -hmm. of places like, uh, um, well, because of the new elections, Finland, unfortunately, and Germany and others, um, that decided that, um, in actual fact, they weren't going to be um, you know, in solidarity with mm -hmm. Greece as much as they could have. And that was regrettable. Um, and that's why, actually, that is an argument for more decisions at a European level to be made and involved at uh, European Parliament level. So democratic. So you, need you that think the democratic. European Union needs to become more democratic still, I Absolutely. assume. Absolutely. So the European already. Parliament needs a greater role in decision yeah. making and it should be less about the Commission. Mm -hmm. It should be less about the um, the Council of Ministers. Because that's, you know, that, that, that is not a democratically elected institution at a European level. Uh, and I think the European Parliament needs to have a greater say in things like the, the migrant crisis. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, and the Greek crisis. Yeah. We need to involve the institutions that have been democratically elected by European citizens. Yeah. And uh, I have a, it's a quick question, I guess. I shouldn't take up too much of your time. I have a question that I was had submitted to me online uh, concerning Trident, which is something. It's like a, it's like a, a memory. It's a, kind of makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Cause I haven't thought about Trident for at least six months. I, it seemed to disappear after the election last year. I, I remember it the general election, it was all the time, all over the place. You'd hear people talking about it online. Um, but the question is, I mean, the Scottish National Party are against Trident. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, yes. yes. It's an obscene waste of money. Yes. It's and an obscene waste of money for something that will never be used, mm -hmm. uh, for something that they call a deterrent, but in actual fact it makes our country less safe. It doesn't make our... How on earth does having nuclear weapons on your soil make your... <laughs> make you more safe given that you're never going to use it at any point. It's yeah. just, the whole argument is, is, is ridiculous. So for you, is it more the money or the morals of the question? Because it does cost a lot of money. Both. It's both. both. Yeah. It's absolutely both. Mm -hmm. uh, I want them out of my soil. I want them out right. of my country. And you would be in favour of an increase in conventional forces? Yes, well, that's where, you know, if, if, if you're going to invest in defence, mm -hmm. and every government has to invest in defence, mm -hmm then that's what it should be. It should yes. be in conventional forces. And actually, if you look at the, the figures, mm -hmm. the UK has been uh, cutting mm -hmm. those conventional forces from Scotland in that Scottish budget mm -hmm. with regards to um, operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I want to see more uh, investment uh, there than I would in nuclear weapons. With, so the, the NATO 2% um, that you hear a lot about right here, 2% of your GDP is going on defense um, and there's a big debate about it I guess do you think two percent is too high or too low well do you know I think there's a lot of countries now that are well particularly France and the UK that are starting yeah. to share yes um, and uh, and I want to see more of that uh, between the European countries uh, more um, obviously you know I think I think I think it is it is the way to go obviously there's 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 Jobs on the line with regard to production mm -hmm. in different parts of uh, different parts of the UK, but you can still have arrangements where you're sharing facilities. I think yes. that that's perfectly plausible. I don't see why not. Um, so I would like to see that more of that going forward between European countries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the last one, uh, and these are these are kind of I guess cultural questions. Mm. Um, so one of the things I I kind of totted them up uh, since two thousand and seven. Which uh -huh. is this is this drop down a little bit? Don't worry about it. Um, since two thousand and seven, there have been, and if you include these two upcoming votes in May and in June, the EU ref, uh, there will have been three referendums, two general elections, three Scottish parliamentary elections, and two European parliamentary elections. So like ten votes in nine years, um, and I think that the referendum took a lot of energy. It was very energy consuming. You mentioned it at the beginning of the show, or I think it might have just been before the show, that it was a very intense period of time. Mm. If you taught all that up, I mean, do we have Scotland specifically slightly disproportionately to the rest of the UK because of the added IndyRef? 
Uh, do we have voting fatigue? Are we just are we tired? There's an aspect of the whole Ooh. culture that's just tired of campaigning and tired well, of another um, election. I love it, but I can understand why a lot of people wouldn't. And I, I think I suspect you enjoy it too. Well, yes, I yes. do. And well, in two weeks after this is uh, yes. after this election is all over, we're <laughs> we're out straight away for campaigning mm. the European referendum. Yeah. So it's it's constantly ongoing, mm. um, and it's a cycle of politics. It never mm. stops. And no, do you know what? I think since the referendum. Mm. Um, yes, it was the most fantastic campaign that I've ever been. I was at the very heart of it. I worked for uh, Yes Scotland for a brief period, period of time, and um, it was, um, uh, you know, seeing people energised, meeting rooms across across the country packed full of people, mm-hmm. sixteen and seventeen year olds being given the vote for the first time, mm-hmm. European nationals involved in this debate because it was their home, their country too, and they had mm-hmm. the right to vote. And we gave them the right to vote in the referendum. It was just a vibrant. Yeah. campaign um, and uh, and I think since then people have taken a genuine interest in politics mm-hmm. um, and they're more informed about their country mm-hmm. and, um, and and I, th- I think that's important I think that people knowing about the strengths and the weaknesses of our country is crucial because then they can make a more informed decision yeah. uh, when it comes to elections I don't think people are tired um, um, they might you know be tired of um, election leaflets and um, uh, my opponent has uh, I think um, destroyed a forest which um, opponent? <laughs> uh, one of my opponents I think has, uh, has des- destroyed a, a, an entire forest to, to, to put through uh, tons of leaflets through people's doors but that's, uh, that's, that's by the by um, uh, and maybe they're tired of that mm-hmm. um, but I don't think they're, they're tired of elections particularly after this referendum the, 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 the Scottish referendum I think they feel energised, engaged um, and um, uh, uh, and it's great to see it's yeah. great to see young people uh, involved in politics. Yes. Um, now I want to ask sort of the flip side of what you've just said, and I've led you into it slightly, but uh, I think that it's a fair question. I think that it's something that concerns a lot of people. Do you think that since many of these votes, including prominently the referendum, that Scotland is a more divided country uh, than it was five years ago? Do you think that that is a legacy? the SNP should be proud of? Or do you think it's a necessary legacy of their push to have that debate? No, I think... That, there's, no, there's no question that it, the country is more divided. And will those wounds heal? I'd like to know what you think about that. Well, look, I think that the exercise, the democratic exercise that we had uh, in 2014 was, was necessary. Yes. Because I think everyone accepts that the SNP won the... Scottish election. And, in 2011? Yes, yes, and that we had a mandate mm-hmm. to have a referendum, and I think that people accepted that. Mm-hmm. Um, the result is now perhaps that opinion on the issue is a little bit more polarised, and mm-hmm. I'm seeing a little bit more polarised... It was polarised before, in fairness. It, it was polarised <laughs> before, but I think it's even mm-hmm. more polarised yeah. after the referendum. Um, and views tend to have consolidated a little bit, but there are still some people in the middle who remain unconvinced either way Mm. Uh, and they're seeing that with the fact that we didn't get all the powers that were promised to us the vow was completely broken because we did not get federalism uh, as you you're a you're a federalist yes and that was one of the problems of course it's hard uh as a as someone who uh, it was really a cultural question yes um yes because of that again dual nationality with a European yes because I have all three so that's what makes yes. it so difficult to me but I could sympathize with the idea of more powers because um well for independence but I thought well you know because you go halfway but that was that was um a very fun era I guess but yes. it was polarized from the beginning and it was it was yes, exciting it was. for it all was. that but it maybe was. that's the negative the division right but but you know and and within families and amongst you mm. know a group of friends people had different views but isn't that healthy in a democracy yeah to have different views, mm. to express views, to debate our country's future, I think that's a, I think that's a good place to be. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people that paint this in the negative, and I think, you know, having people engaged and motivated and passionate about politics for the first time in years, I think that's something to be proud of, you know. And if people's views are polarised and if they feel more passionate about it, then I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Mm. It means perhaps that they've thought about it. It means that they, uh, they they've considered the issues and and you know and 
one way or another, they feel strongly about it. And I think that's something to celebrate. That sounds like a great way to end. Uh, thank you very much, Tony Giuliano. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you very Come much. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you very much for having me.